Welcome to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we are broadcasting live on November 7th from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And this hour, we're going to be talking about the Israel-Hamas war. And I want to read you just a couple of sentences of the latest news that comes from the AP. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says Israel will have overall security responsibility in Gaza for an indefinite period after its war with Hamas. And he expressed openness to little pauses in the current fighting to facilitate the release of hostages. His comments in an ABC News interview that aired late yesterday offered the clearest indication yet that Israel plans to maintain control over the territory that's home to about 2.3 million Palestinians. Netanyahu ruled out any general ceasefire without the release of more than 240 captives that were seized by Hamas in its October 7th raid into Israel. The health ministry in Gaza says the Palestinian death toll has now exceeded 10,000 people. More than 1,400 people in Israel have been killed. So joining us now to talk about this, all this by Zoom, is what is Ayaba Trawi, and she's going to talk about what she and her team are seeing in Gaza and Israel. She's an NPR international correspondent, and she leads NPR's Gulf Bureau in Dubai. You also may remember Aya from her time as a volunteer reporter here at WMNF. So welcome to Tuesday Cafe, Aya. Thank you. It is so good to be back with you. Um, yeah, I grew up in St. Pete, so I am a hometown girl, although I left a long time ago. But I grew up in St. Pete, um, so a lot of those schools, Northeast High and um, Largo High School, and I also attended, um, yeah, I just lived in Northeast St. Pete and went to the University of South Florida, got my master, uh, sorry, my mass comm degree and history degrees from there. So so good and i have to say like wnf feels like home to me it's like where i've got my first shot at radio and where i kind of learned what it's like to work in a community radio station and how important local radio and local support for wmnf really is so thank you so much for having me back well i'm really glad you could join us and congratulations on all you've done since you left the area very successful career with ap now with npr and maybe we'll talk a little bit more about all that uh, as we go out through the interview um, let's start about uh, rewinding to about a month ago and where where were you on October 7th and then what happened? Where did NPR send you right after October 7th? So October 7th was the day that around, they, Israelis say, around 2,000 militants from the Gaza Strip infiltrated Israel. And you might remember, of course, the shocking images of them on motorboats and or speedboats of some kind, parachutes. Um, busting through the wall, the partition wall between Gaza and Israel. And um, those attacks killed 1,400 Israelis. According to Israeli officials, um, the militants took around 240 hostages, many of them women and children and elderly. So I was at home in Dubai, where my base is, when I started to see the news. And I have to say, it took around three or four days for the public to really understand or begin to understand what happened. If you'll recall, there were a few days where it was even unclear if Israel had been able to actually secure its territory again. It had been days where like the main police station and the city of Sterod was still under uh, control by some of these militants. So, of course, as someone who's covered the Middle East for a very long time, it was clear, though, from just the beginning that um, this was huge. And this was unprecedented and that the response would be pummeling. Um, and so immediately on October 8th, I was sent to Israel on like one of the first flights from Dubai. There are direct flights from the UAE to Israel. And um, the regional reaction was swift from the other Middle Eastern countries. Immediately the reaction was, we've been warning something like this is going to happen. And there had been so many warnings in the lead up from Arab countries, including um, Israel's allies, in the region that were saying there has been so many escalations from uh, members of his right wing government um, in the West Bank and around the sensitive uh, holy site of Al-Aqsa, which is the Temple Mount in Jerusalem to Jews. And so as much as it was a stunning surprise to many, it also did seem to some to be something that almost was inevitable, given just how sensitive and how um, escalatory, everything had been in the lead up. Where were you stationed in, in, in um, Israel? 
I spent the first few days in Tel Aviv uh, talking to people there, um, making phone calls to people in Gaza as well from there. Um, just getting a sense of the grief and the shock and the um, pain that everybody was feeling. Um, I also attended a press conference by um, the relatives of Israeli American hostages who were taken. Um, and I met a girl there named Ayana Nate. Her mother, Ariana Nate, was taken. Um, we have a clip from her if you want to play it. And that was the daughter of an Israeli hostage saying that uh, Israel is going to fight for their lives uh, that you, that our guest, Aya Batrawi, spoke to when she was in Tel Aviv just just after the uh, October 7th attacks. Yeah, I mean, her mother was a nurse. She's an American Israeli nurse. And here's the thing that she was saying to me. She grew up in one of these kibbutz that are in the south, very leftist kibbutz, she said, um, very left leaning. And she said that she grew up actually knowing people in Gaza before there had been this massive withdrawal from Gaza by Israeli settlers. And they took down the settlements there in Israeli building blocks. And then they partitioned and sort of just like closed off Gaza from the rest of Israel. So this was a totally different era. Like people might not even remember that this was the case, that they actually used to live together in the same area. And um, maybe it wasn't, you know, like that neighborly, but they used to share the same coastline and the same beach. And she's saying like, and I think what was so interesting about her quote is kind of how she says, like, I just don't see them the same anymore. And I don't think I can differentiate between civilians and Hamas. And I think that's a very interesting thing to say, because what we're also seeing in Gaza are staggering numbers that we have never seen before in, in these conflicts. And I've talked to so many people who've worked for so long on Gaza, doctors, aid workers, UN representatives who've been in and out of Gaza for years, and they've never seen what we're seeing. In just one month, there have been over 10,300 deaths, according to the Palestinian health officials there. There have been over 4,300 children killed. The latest figures today, and those numbers are rising every day. The latest figures are 26,000 wounded in the Gaza Strip. And 1,300 children missing under the rubble still. A 1,000 unidentified bodies, mass graves. The situation is so bad that they haven't had time to identify the people they're burying. And it's so dire that I've been hearing from doctors and people in the northern part of Gaza that they aren't even able to reach the wounded. And so they're digging with their bare hands. You've probably seen these on social media, on videos on social media, people digging with their bare hands, unable to reach to these people. So there are people who are trapped under the rubble that are alive and they cannot be saved. Um, you know, bread lines have been bombed. Hospitals have been bombed. Um, schools, UN shelters have been bombed. Two, over 200,000 homes, according to the Palestinians, have been destroyed. Universities have been bombed. Um, you know, you have ambulances have been bombed. We just had a convoy of ambulances on Friday out front of the biggest hospital in Gaza, Al Shifa Hospital, bombed. The Palestinian Red Crescent says they were their ambulance was carrying a 35-year-old woman who was critically injured to 
south to the Rafah crossing so she could get treatment in Egypt. And they said that their uh, ambulance was uh, attacked in a, by an Israeli missile. And that attack killed 15 people outside of the hospital and wounded 60 others. It was a horrific scene of just carnage. Israel says it was attacking an ambulance and they claimed that the ambulance was carrying a Hamas person. But the Palestinian Red Crescent gave the name and the age of the woman in that ambulance. So it's really unclear, like, you know, when these claims are made, how 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 Israel is deciding what to strike. But one thing that's very clear, I think, to many people is that the scale of this is unimaginable. I've been I mean, these are the words I hear from people. We have more quotes if you want to play, like if you want to play, for example, um, what I was told by um, Dr. Natalie Thurtle. She used to run Doctors Without Borders um, program for the Palestinian territories until 2021. I reached her uh, recently, and if you want, you can play what she says. And before we get to Doctors Without Borders, Dr. Natalie Thurtle, I want to remind people that our guest is Aya Batraoui. She's an NPR international correspondent. She leads NPR's Gulf Bureau in Dubai. And we're talking about the latest news from the fighting between Israel and Hamas. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. So here's some uh, some a uh, minute and a half soundbite of this Dr. Natalie Thurtle from MSF, which is Doctors Without Borders. That's Natalie Thurtle, who is a Doctors Without Borders doctor and telling about the dire situation in the Gaza Strip. And our guest is Aya Batraoui, an NPR international correspondent. Uh, Aya, uh, what can you add to what the doctor was telling us? So again, as you heard her say, she's never seen anything of the scale. And I need to just keep emphasizing that because everyone I've spoken to who works in Gaza or who lives in Gaza continues to tell me this. And Gaza has been through a lot. This is its fifth war or conflict since 2008. So if you're a 15 year old child, this is your fifth war or something close to it in just your entire lifespan. Um, you know, the psychological trauma in addition to this cannot be described. And I struggle with words to try to explain and understand as well, like the trauma to children. I saw one video that I think really, really captures some of the trauma that children in Gaza are facing because they can hear the bombs. They can hear a constant sound of drones humming overhead, Israeli aerial surveillance drones and, and, and armed drones. They have been, you know, over a million and a half people or something like that. I think that's the latest figure have been displaced from their homes. Like I said, 200,000 people's homes have been destroyed. So, so people are living, you know, thousands of people in these small UN shelters, thousands at a time. You know, there's no clean water for a lot of them. There's not enough food coming in. You know, Israel had put Gaza basically under full siege with just a small trickle of trucks, aid trucks being able to come in through Egypt. And even then, most of those trucks, almost all of them can only distribute to certain parts of Gaza in the south. They cannot reach hundreds of thousands of people still in the north. People simply cannot evacuate. They're, they say there's no safe place to go. Even across the southern Gaza Strip, 
There have been bombs. There have been attacks. People have died. Um, and so if you're a child, you've been disrupted your life. You're not in school anymore. You don't talk to your friends. You may very well have seen people die and be pulled out of the rubble. That's a very common thing for children to see in Gaza. It's a small territory of 2.3 million people, one of the most densely populated areas in the north, sorry, in the world. And then in addition to that, again, not your first war. So the sound of bombs is constant. You're living in a refugee camp or you might be living in a, in a school displaced, you know, sharing bathrooms. You're, you may have lost a parent. There are, I mean, the figure, the latest figure that I saw of the number of families that have lost, um, people. Uh, it's, it's staggering. Um, for example, uh, let me find you this figure from um, the uh, UN, which basically says that um, since October 7th, 8,005 Palestinians have been, uh, sorry, uh, this is not the one, um, sorry, the one with, I'll get the number, okay. Um, I'll get the number, sorry, of the families in a second, because I want to get this accurate. But basically, the, the trauma to the children is insane. And so back to this video that I saw, one of the videos was of a girl. She had, you know, just suits all over her. I don't know if she'd been pulled from the rubble or she'd clearly come out of a bombing. And as her, as an adult, a male was carrying her, running with her physically to the hospital, she still had her, her fingers in her ears from the sound of the bomb. Like, she still thought that the bomb was ringing. Um, so I spoke with uh, the UN Children Fund, UNICEF, their spokesperson, um, his name is uh, Toby Fricker. And I'd like also if you could play um, the soundbite that he talks about, where he talks about the psychological trauma on children in Gaza. Our guest is Aya Batrawi, and here is her interview with the UNICEF spokesperson. That's Toby Fricker, the UNICEF spokesperson, talking about trauma to children in the war in Gaza, in the Gaza Strip. And, you know, Aya, before we go too far, you mentioned just a moment ago that there's 2.3 million people living in the Gaza Strip, and it's one of the most densely populated places on Earth. To give a scale, uh, the, the length of the Gaza Strip is about 25 miles long, and it's about four to seven miles wide. And just for comparison, Pinellas County is 38 miles long. So you could fit Gaza, the Gaza Strip easily within Pinellas County. And the population of Pinellas, which is the most densely populated county in Florida, is less than a million people. So there's 2.3 million people in the Gaza Strip, just to give people an idea of, of how densely populated it is. It's, there are big cities there. There are refugee camps that have turned into uh, permanent camps, essentially, because there's really no place for these people to go. There's there's a small crossing in into Egypt that's mostly closed. What else can you tell us just about the geography and and uh, what else we might need to know about that area of the world? I mean, a lot of the people that live there are refugees. So these are people who had been displaced either forcibly or, um, you know, felt like they had to leave um, uh, when Israel's uh, was created in 1948. So a lot of them are not native necessarily to this particular part of the world. Um, and so they don't identify as necessarily coming from this part of the world and they're cut off from the rest of the world. So it, the territory has been under a blockade by Israel and Egypt has supported that blockade from its one crossing with Gaza because it does not want to essentially have to absorb 2.3 million refugees um, and I can explain that in a second as well, as there's been some pressure on Egypt to do that now. And, but this has mainly been an Israeli uh, blockade. And so, you know, these people say that they are on a calorie strict diet, like only a certain amount of uh, trucks can go in every day uh, before the war to provide food. Uh, there was already, uh, you know, um, like a lot of like uh, specialized health care is absolutely not available there. So so people would wait on these long, long kind of lists to get approval from Israel to maybe get some specialized cancer treatment or whatever they needed in Israel. And a lot of children would die waiting on those lists. That's been widely reported by the Associated Press and others. 
over the years. Um, and so a siege on Gaza means if you if you get a scholarship to go to a really great university abroad or you have a friend, you know, that, you know, abroad who's getting married or you just want to go to the West Bank and see some relatives on the Palestinian West Bank side in those cities or you've got relatives in Jordan as refugees or whatever, you can't leave the Gaza Strip. Um, and it's very uh, difficult as well uh, for them to imagine anything other than, you know, their life there. And so for children, again, like you've never seen the outside world. This is all you've known. Um, and I think over a million people in Gaza are children. That's the numbers I keep seeing as well. So half of this population is children, which is why out of 10,000 deaths, 4,300 of them, so over 40% are children. Um, and according to the Ministry of Health in Gaza, listen to this number, as of October 27th, so that's several days ago, 192 Palestinian families had lost 10 or more of their relatives. 136 Palestinian families had lost, has lost six to nine family members. So these are staggering. So you're talking about entire families that have been wiped off the registry. They don't exist anymore. I've also heard of a lot of children showing up at hospitals, young children. Nobody knows who they are. No one knows who their relatives are. They don't have adults with them because their families have been killed or are under the rubble. And these children are traumatized. And they, they, you know, they're like three years old and two years old and babies. They don't even know their full names. They don't know, you know, their parents' names. They don't know their addresses. They can't talk. And again, because of the displacement of families, it's very hard for families to check and ask hospitals and hospitals are so overwhelmed. They're at beyond capacity. Hospitals are beyond their capacity. I just got off the phone before I got on this interview with the chief surgeon for the International Committee of the Red Cross. He's one of a, a small, small group of people, about like eight of them, I think, who went in around two weeks ago. And he was telling me some of the cases he's seeing in South Gaza, which is supposed to be the safe zone, the area that people have been told to evacuate to. And he was just talking about the kinds of injuries he's seeing to children and to people. And he was talking about this one guy that he was just about to go operate on. He had to hang up with me because this guy's sitting on the operating table. He'd lost 11 members of his family. No one knows, you know, none of his family members are around. No, no one is alive. There was like one guy in America who might be related to him that was like calling on the phone to ask. He's got, you know, severe burns on 40% of his body, shrapnel throughout his body. I mean, these are the these are the kinds of cases doctors are seeing every day. And I think, you know, if you're sitting in Tampa, you're sitting in St. Pete, you're sort of like, how does this impact me? What is what does this have to do with me? And I think like if you want, Sean, we could take a step back also and sort of talk about the US position in all of this. Yeah, we'll certainly talk about that. I want to remind people that uh, we're talking with Ava Trawi, an NPR international correspondent. She leads NPR's Gulf Bureau in Dubai, and we're talking about the latest news in the fighting between Israel and Hamas. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And uh, you mentioned a moment ago about um, why all these residents of Gaza, these 2.3 million people can't just exit and just uh, li live in um, in Egypt, for example. And there's a quote that I read in the Times of Israel. There was a far right minister in the Knesset who has said that um, that the population of of Gaza should go to Ireland or go to the deserts, which presumably he means perhaps the Sinai Desert, which is uh, part of Egypt. And you mentioned a moment ago that there there are issues, there there are problems, concerns with having the the residents of Gaza go elsewhere. How would you ex respond to those things? Yeah, there was also a cabinet minister um, on Sunday who said that Amahai Eliao is his name. Yeah, I may have missed when I said he was in the Knesset. I'm okay, sorry. yeah, I mean no, because a lot of people have said that as well. So it may have been more than one person. Um, and he also said that. Um, dropping a nuclear bomb on Gaza is an option. He also said, he also described all of the people in Gaza as monsters and said there are no uninvolved civilians. That is not necessarily the view of every Israeli. I spent time in Israel and there's a wide range of views and there are views that are more thoughtful and more um, you know, careful in their considerations. There are views that bombing all of Gaza is not going to solve this. There are, you know, people whose children have been taken hostage who don't want to see other children being killed in Gaza as a result. But I think um, his views definitely cannot be dismissed as um, 
some lone opinion. He's a member of cabinet and he does represent um, some of the very hardline views in Israel. Um, and yeah, so that is a view. So what we understand is that there has been pressure on Israel build, sorry, on Egypt building to accept Palestinians from the Gaza Strip. And, and the Egyptian president himself actually came out and said that there is a, a, a basically a plan to do this and that the siege on Gaza to st essentially starve people, keep them from being able to access clean water to drink or to shower with, you know, uh, people are unable to find flour to bake bread. There's no electricity. There's no fuel coming in. Generators at hospitals are shutting down. All of this is meant to push people into Egypt, the Sinai Peninsula, which borders Gaza. But he said that this would be a really bad idea because first of all, Palestinians don't want to leave their homes under this kind of threat. They want to stay and live in peace in their homes. Number two, Egypt doesn't believe that they'll be allowed back. We've seen time and time again over generations, Palestinians uh, leaving, being displaced and never being allowed to return. So there's real threats that this would be a permanent displacement. You know, Egypt has a huge economic crisis and an overpopulation problem. You know, the president continues to talk about that over and over again. I don't know that it can absorb 2.3 million people. But also he said that, you know, Palestinians resistance to Israel will continue if they were to move to Egypt. And that would draw Israel and them into conflict and draw Egypt into a conflict with Israel, which Egypt doesn't want to do. You know, Egypt has has a peace treaty with Israel, it was the first Arab country to do that. So there are real concerns that this is regional and that this is impacting a lot of countries and a lot of people around the region. Our guest is Aya Batraoui, NPR international correspondent. She leads NPR's Gulf Bureau in Dubai, and we're talking about Israel-Hamas war. And this is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canaan. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And we'll get, I'm sure, d later in the program, we'll talk about how the U.S. is involved and what the U.S.'s role is in this. But let's uh, take a call right now because we're broadcasting live on November 7th. And we have a call here from Simon. Let's see what Simon has to say. Hi, Simon. Hi, good morning. Thank you very much for taking my call. I hope that the International Red Cross can make a visit to the hostages and can tell the world they're safe. Um, you've written about uh, the Muslim Brotherhood a great deal, and I think of Sai Kutta. Uh What comes to mind is the Hama massacre, and a lot of refugees went to where you live in the Emirates. I don't think you want Israel to fight wars the way Arab and Muslim countries fight wars. All right, let's see what Aya has to say about that. What can you tell us? Most of us are not uh, don't have all that information on the tip of our tongues like Simon does. So so uh, fill in what was he talking about and respond to him if you don't mind, Aya. Sure. So on the issue of the Muslim Brotherhood, yes, Hamas is an offshoot of um, the Muslim Brotherhood um, from the 1970s, uh, but it is not a uh, a direct arm of the Muslim Brotherhood, um, and it has gone into multiple, uh, you know, tried to have multiple agreements and, and uh, with Fatah, the uh, rival authority in the West Bank, and the U.S. actually asked Qatar in the 1990s to open a Hamas office in Doha because the U.S. did not want to have to deal directly with Hamas. Uh, one thing I think that's worth noting is that for years and years and years, uh, Qatar was able to send over a billion dollars to the Gaza Strip to pay for the pub part of the public salaries of teachers and doctors and others through an agreement with Israel. And that money went to Hamas and Hamas was able to distribute that money. And how Hamas, which governs the Gaza Strip, was able to do that was because Israel agreed. So people who support this policy in Israel say it was important because it helped keep Hamas kind of keeping the status quo in place and it sort of um, allowed uh, the Gaza Strip not to completely collapse. But detractors and critics say that this was actually a, a, a bigger political move and it was meant to undermine the Palestinian Authority and the West Bank because then you could say that you don't have a Palestinian partner to deal with and then you could avoid having to really negotiate a real peace process that leads to two states. And that is the words of Israelis. You know, I'm speaking about what I've heard from Israelis and what, you know, Israelis who are opposed to Benjamin Netanyahu's policies say. 
And there are real divisions in Israel. There were real divisions in Israel leading up to this conflict. You saw tens of thousands of people taking to the streets almost every day, opposing Netanyahu's uh, judicial reforms. You're seeing now a coalition government, but it's unclear, you know, how much cooperation, how much agreement exists within that government, within those officials. You know, uh, we've seen the U.S. Uh, come in now and urge for humanitarian pauses in the conflict. The U.S. is Israel's top supporter. It has sent bombs. It has sent military advisors to this conflict to help Israel. It has sent, um, you know, missile defense systems. It has uh, declared unequivocally Israel has a right to defend itself. We heard from a national security advisor, John Kirby, recently saying that there are no red lines for Israel. But we've also heard them recently start saying that there should be humanitarian pauses and Israel remaining defiant and saying that Hamas has to be crushed. So the goal of this operation is to essentially make sure that Hamas can never operate again in Gaza. But, you know, I don't think it's clear to me as a journalist and to many others exactly how that's going to be achieved with the current um, campaign. Um, and. One thing I know is that talking to Palestinians in the Gaza Strip over the years, when I would ask them how they feel about surviving past conflicts, I would never hear revenge. I would never hear someone say we want, you know, to take out revenge on Israel. They would always talk about we want to go back to school. I want to get my education. I want to um, I want to, you know, um, get better so I can walk again. Like it was really simple asks from life. But I will say that this level of destruction, which again, everyone I've spoken to has said is bigger than they've ever seen. I don't know what kind of generation it's leaving behind and I don't know what kind of trauma it's creating and whether you know, it could be leaving behind an even fiercer kind of rejection and resistance to, to peace. Our guest is Aya Batraoui, an international correspondent for NPR, and she leads NPR's Gulf Bureau in Dubai. We're talking about the latest news in the Israel-Hamas war. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we are broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. We were just talking about the U.S. role and the U.S. response. Let's hear a little bit. Here's a short clip from uh, Antony Blinken, the U.S. Secretary of State. He was in Israel just the other day. So here's um, what he maybe sees for what can be achieved in uh, after the war. We're Even as we work toward progress uh, on each of these urgent needs, we're focused on setting the conditions for a durable and sustainable peace and security. The United States continues to believe that the best viable path, indeed the only path, is through a two-state solution. That's the only guarantor of a secure Jewish and democratic Israel. The only guarantor of Palestinians realizing their legitimate right to live in a state of their own, enjoying equal measures of security, freedom, opportunity, and dignity. The only way to end a cycle of violence once and for all. And it's precisely now, in the darkest moments, that we have to fight hardest to preserve a path of stability, of security, of opportunity, of integration, of prosperity, and of peace. Well, that's Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State from the U.S., speaking in Israel the other day about a durable peace that would happen after this conflict is over about how there would be two states, a Jewish and democratic state and a Palestinian state. So, uh, Aya, your, your thoughts on hearing the Secretary of State speaking there? Um, I, if I heard what he was saying and I didn't know what was happening in Gaza, I would say that sounds incredibly um, hopeful. But um, also, I just don't see how his words right now and those um, aspirations align with what we're seeing on the ground. But one thing he did say that I think was telling was he said, we have to fight to preserve the path to freedom, prosperity, and peace. I think he said that. I've heard that a bit too in Israel, that you have to fight for peace. And it's kind of an oxymoron, if you think about it, that you have to fight a war to get to peace, that you have to bomb to reach uh, peace. You know, one of the people that I met when I was in um, Israel was a former IDF soldier, a former soldier from the Israeli military who actually 
had uh, been, um, he served in the West Bank um, and he was part of the occupation there. And he's, he's from a very right wing family and he has come to realize over time that he doesn't believe that what he did was right. And he's part of a group called Breaking the Silence. Again, I think it's important to explain that there are a wide range of views in Israel. And, you know, he, he also finds it really interesting and, and, does, and he also questions kind of this idea that you can fight your way to peace, that war is the answer to peace. Um, and, and so, you know, we didn't even talk about the West Bank, by the way, this whole time. That's a whole other thing. But if we can focus on Gaza, that, that, that's a fine, too, because there's so much happening in Gaza. And I think the scale of it is so hard to put in words. But, you know, if you don't mind playing, we have a clip from I have a clip from a girl named Tasneem Ahad. She's in Gaza City. I just want to set up her clip and explain kind of what you're about to hear. She's a medical student in Gaza. And I've been in touch with her since the beginning of the war. She's been sending me voice notes because communications there have been cut, phone lines are bad. So she's in Gaza City. This is a city that Israeli troops now say they've encircled and they're calling on everybody in the city, the biggest city in Gaza to evacuate. Her house got bombed in the beginning of the war. Then her another house she went to got bombed again. And so now she's in some school that's being used as a shelter by her and a few other families. Um, she's like, she's lost everything. Like over time, you know, over the past month, I've heard her tell me about the friends that she's lost. I've heard her tell me about the university of hers that got bombed. She was, she goes everywhere with her lab coat, her medical white coat. She will not leave it. And she tells me I sleep with it. And I asked her, why do you sleep with your medical coat? She's like, cause it's my dream. And I want, and if I die, I want to die with my dream in my hands. So her university was bombed. That uh, was very painful for her, you know, her school. And she said to me, I feel like, I feel like they've erased our existence here. Like everything that was something that proved that she was there is gone, including even friends that knew her. And um, she can't leave Gaza City. She's like, we don't know. I mean, Israel has given evacuation notices to people, dropped leaflets, sent text messages. Again, a lot of people can't charge their phones. Um, they're not getting you know reception. She says that like she doesn't know when the, the these corridors to, for safe exit are, are even being announced. Um, she tells me that you know, she's asking me when these times are. <laughs> um, and I'm in Dubai, you know, and um, and she's also saying that, like, the situation is so dire that they've had to rub rummage through the rubble of their home and pull out like flour that's mixed with dirt to try to eat that. That's how bad the situation is. Um, and I just want to warn listeners, there is some like uh, gunfire, I think missile tank fire. She says this is missile fire from a plane, um, an Israeli plane or something, Israeli war plane. But yeah, let's just, she, this is the voice note she sent me yesterday about from Gaza City. And her name again? Tasneem Ahel. And she's a student, a medical student in Gaza City. Here's her voice. And throughout this clip, you can hear the bombs and the. Well, that was, that was a voice message that our guest was left by the student, this medical student in Gaza City, and you're listening to WMNF Tampa. So, Aya, tell us more ab about uh, that voice message that you got from Tasneem Ahel. You know, her voice notes have gotten more and more uh, desperate um, with time. Um, you know, she really wants her voice to be heard 
So she's determined to send me voice messages when she can. She's determined to, to let her voice be heard. Um, so talking to me is really important to her, you know, um, because she believes her life matters and she wants people to know what she's going through. And, you know, she can't really upload videos to Instagram or communicate or even call me, but sometimes her voice notes go through and, um, that's, that's the kind of stuff she's sending me. And that's, that's what she sent me yesterday. Um, and, you know, for her, if she did leave Gaza City at this point, she, first of all, would her and her family would have to walk by foot for miles before they got anywhere safe. And even then, there's no guarantee of safety where they're going in the South. Um, they may have nowhere to go. Again, they're going to end up um, part of like a group of more than 700,000 people that are at UN run schools in the South. And just to say, the UN also says that there are about 117,000 people in the north of Gaza and northern parts of Gaza um, where Israel has ordered evacuations um, that are in UN run schools there that don't have any services to help because the UN can't reach them. And there are 13 hospitals in Gaza City and the northern part of the Gaza that they've all been asked to evacuate. And again, I mean, they cannot. They simply cannot. The doctors there are saying, first of all, we still continue to receive a stream of wounded people every day. Second of all, we have people on life support. We have people who are badly injured. We can't just transport these people. There's no way. I mean, their ambulances are being hit. There's not enough fuel. Um, these people, you know, moving them could kill them. There are tens of thousands of people sheltering these hospitals. Um, it's very, very complex, very complex. Our guest is Aya Batrawi, an international correspondent for NPR, and she leads w she leads NPR's Gulf Bureau in Dubai. And we're talking about the latest news in the fighting between Israel and Hamas. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canaan. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF Tampa. And uh, uh, we've been talking so much about all the horror horrors that are going on in Israel and in Gaza Strip. And I, I um, want to maybe look at more a little bit at the politics here in Florida uh, related to all of this. And we might have time at the near to the end of the show to go back and talk a little bit more about what's happening right now in Gaza. But let's change gears a little bit and talk about Florida. For example, the future of a University of South Florida student organization remains uncertain. The group is called Students for Justice in Palestine, and it's come into the national spotlight in recent days. The state sent a letter to public universities ordering them to disband chapters on their campuses. So we're going to hear a short clip here from Cesar Esmeraldi. He's the USF student body president. We are in communication with administration. And also, I know they're in communication with the chancellor and their administration as well to fully understand what the letter means and what the implications could be. And Chancellor Ray Rodriguez sent the letter to university presidents at the direction of Governor Ron DeSantis. The letter does not give schools a deadline to act, but it does say that if they do not follow the order to disband students for justice in Palestine, that uh, school officials could face penalties, including suspension. USF officials have not yet said which steps that, or what steps that is that they're taking in regards to this group. So I want to ask our guest, Aya Batrawi, who also uh, was a student at USF, uh, who, what are your thoughts about an international conflict like this spilling over to student groups at state universities here in Florida? Um, you know, I grew up in Florida and I was a lot of the times the only person like me in the school or the classroom. Um, I remember when I first moved to St. Pete, there were no mosques in St. Pete. Um, this is in the eighties, early eighties. So uh, my dad and his generation of like first generation kind of immigrants, doctors and engineers and whatnot moving to Florida and Florida needed dentists, which my father is. So they gladly accepted, you know, um, him and his skills in Florida. And uh, there were no mosques. And so, you know, I know I know kind of what it's like, at least in that era to you know, maybe have a different perspective than others on certain conflicts that are really, really far away or to have a different understanding of those conflicts. And I remember also being at Uni University of South Florida in the aftermath of 
And that was a really, really difficult time to be a Muslim American because on the one hand, you, you're grieving with Americans and you're shocked and you're horrified to your, and you're sick to your stomach with 9-11 and what happened. And you're so angry that people did this in the name of Islam. And, you know, you're, you're just horrified. At the same time, you're, you're forced to apologize for something that you would never, ever condone or consider you're forced to uh, be the representative of a billion people. And you're forced to also, you're, you're, you face a lot of scrutiny. And I don't always look like uh, where I'm from. Like no one can really tell where I'm from when they first look at me or my background. So people would speak freely in front of me and I would hear sort of how people really felt. And it was really hard. It was really, really hard. Um, and I do feel like a lot of students now are going through that again. Um, there's a huge spike, unfortunately, in both anti-Semitism, you know, acts against Jewish people and also acts against Muslims. Um, and it's really sad to see like universities caught up in this because I do believe in free speech. I think we all do. And I think we all believe in, um, you know, the ability, especially as a student, to be able to ask tough questions and engage in like really rigorous critical thinking. Um, but Florida's always sort of been, I think, like, um, a place where, you know, boundaries are tested and where um, views are really, are really sharp, you know. Um, and yeah, I just, I feel for all the students that are struggling to belong. I feel for all the students that feel like they're being targeted because of their faith, wherever they're from. Um, and, you know, I hope that, you know, Florida is a welcoming and friendly place for you and more than it was when I was growing up. Well, on that same note of, of Florida, there's a special session that started yesterday of the, of the Florida legislature. And um, it was called really, um, you know, there's several things they're gonna take up, but a, a lot of why it was called had to do with increasing state sanctions on Iran for Iran's uh, alleged support of Hamas and so forth. So let's hear this short story from a reporter up in Tallahassee about yesterday's first day of this Florida special session and how it has to do with this conflict that we're talking about this hour. It, um, Florida lawmakers kicked off this special session yesterday. Regan McCarthy reports they'll take up several measures that are aimed at signaling the state's support for Israel. In her opening remarks, State Senate President Kathleen Pasadomo said Governor Ron DeSantis is committed to supporting Israel. And she said DeSantis wants to ensure Florida has tough sanctions against any regime that, quote, supports terrorism. His continuous leadership makes it clear that Florida will not tolerate anti-Semitism or hatred of any kind. Florida lawmakers are slated to take up three bills relating to the Israel-Hamas war. One would expand restrictions on state investment in businesses with ties to Iran. Lawmakers will also consider a bill to ramp up security at Jewish day schools and temples, and they're expected to pass a resolution in support of Israel. I'm Regan McCarthy. Well, thanks for that report out of Tallahassee from Regan McCarthy. And I want to ask my guest, Aya Batrawi, about that, about uh, how the Florida legislature is dealing with this faraway situation that really hits home, I think, um, you know, uh, emotionally for all of us. But it's it seems like it might not be really a state issue to deal with some of these things. Uh, any thoughts about that, Ia? You know, the U.S. Um, is involved in the Middle East, deeply involved in the Middle East, and it's been like that for decades. And it's not um, a neutral bystander. It's deeply involved. And... Um, it has tried and failed over the years uh, to be um, an arbiter or a mediator between the Palestinians and the Israelis. And we're seeing now, uh, you know, exactly what that looks like. All those years of, you know, saying one thing um, and, you know, uh, policies uh, showing another. And, you know, it does it does have an impact on the U.S. and what happens in the U.S. You're, you saw, you know, You've seen acts, hate crimes spike in the U.S. again against Jewish communities and Muslim communities. Um, you're seeing it not just on college campuses, but even among like, you know, people. Like uh, there was a young Muslim boy who was stabbed to death in America, a six-year-old, I believe. 
I think everyone's heard this story um, and, you know, they're looking into whether that was actually a hate crime and they believe it was related to the Israeli uh, conflict in Gaza right now. So, it, you know, this isn't I, like the world just isn't isolated. Like we're all connected nowadays. Like, you know, something that happened, like we saw that with COVID-19, just like how quickly the world is connected and impacted by something that happened in China. And like we all got impacted by it. And so this is a hard one to look at. This is a very difficult story to look at. But, but you know, um, I encourage people to keep doing their research, turning to mainstream news organizations and their community radio stations like this to keep listening, to keep hearing, to keep staying informed. Because the bare minimum, you should have the facts. At the bare minimum, you should have the facts. And 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 we're lucky enough that we have access to so much information, um, you know. Our guest is Aya Batraoui, NPR correspondent, international correspondent, and she leads NPR's Gulf Bureau in Dubai. We're talking about the latest news in the fighting between Israel and Hamas. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. We're broadcasting live on November 7th from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And uh, I'm, I am happy to read your your emails or your texts. And let me see what Twinkle has to say. She says, Thank your guest. What an incredible show. It's heartbreaking, but so wonderful to have her perspective. So thank you for that note, Twinkle. We appreciate that you're listening in and that you appreciate our guests. Uh, let me ask you what we what we know about. You were mentioning the media coverage, and there's been a lot. To me, it seems like there's so much on the ground reporting. We have uh, we we're hearing from people, whether it's because they're they're sending us information from Gaza from from you know their firsthand testimonials. It's not just reporters that we're hearing from. Um, but we also are hearing from CNN's Fareed Zakaria, who says, as a condition to enter Gaza under IDF air support, that's the Israeli military, outlets have to submit all materials and footage to the Israeli military for review prior to publication, and CNN agreed to those terms. So um, during your reporting, you weren't embedded with the IDF when, in, when they were in Gaza, but uh, what kind of... Um, censorship on any side have you had to to face in this conflict yeah you know, luckily i work for a news organization that is really really wonderful and so i've had so much support to just keep telling the facts and telling the story um, we have an incredible producer in gaza named ns baba who's on the ground risking his life every day to tell the story to get us material to get us sound to tell us what's happening we have um you know support staff in egypt and in, um, as far as, as London, even just keeping their eyes on this, um, uh, Palestinian um, support staff in the Jerusalem and so many people on the ground as well, like being flown into Tel Aviv and stuff. So, you know, I didn't face any censorship or anything like that. Um, but you do, you know, you do get caught up, I think, as, in, as a journalist in how to, how to tell the story. Because again, like the scale almost exceeds the language that we have you know you can how many times can someone tell you the word catastrophe or unimaginable or horrific for it to make sense i mean the numbers you know 10,300 people 4,000 plus children each one of those people is a life each one of those people was loved knew somebody was somebody's mother was somebody's child was somebody's father was somebody's brother was somebody's you know somebody's life um, and then same on the Israeli side, you know, 1,400 people killed in those attacks. Um, and then you also have, you know, 240 people taken hostage. And, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for a lot of the coverage that's gone into covering the lives of those hostages. A colleague of mine did a story looking at some of them and they're heartbreaking. Like one of them is a, is a kid with autism. You know, another person was, you know, um, a young girl. Uh, some of them, I think one is a Holocaust survivor, a grandmother. And so... It's just a very, it's difficult, you know, it's a painful story for a lot of people. It's painful for us as journalists to have to look at this and cover it every day. I'm not gonna sugarcoat that. It's a really, really difficult story. And I think words just don't, just we try to find the words every day. We try to tell the stories and, and raise the voices of people, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's a really tricky one. On that note, I, I want to thank you very much for coming on WMNF today, Aya Batraoui. Thanks for being generous and, and giving a, an hour of your time to let your your audience back home, let no, let them know what's happening out there in the world. So thank you, Aya Batraoui, NPR correspondent. Thanks, John. Thank you so much for your show and for WMNF. And I'm so grateful for all the listener support that goes into the station. 
um, you know, it's so important to the community out there. So thank you all for your support to the station. And thank you, Sean, for your, your support and your commitment to your audience. Well, thanks. Aya. Aya is an NPR international correspondent. She leads NPR's Gulf Bureau in Dubai.